This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ana Sofia Simão de Portugal. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 31 Italy, seen by the sailor. Towards the beginning of the year 1838, two young men belonging to the First Society of Paris, the Vicomte Albert de Montserrat, and the Baron France d'Epinay were at Florence. They had agreed to see the carnival at Rome that year, and that France, for for the last three or four years had inhabited Italy, should act as a Cicerone to Albert. As it is no inconsiderable affair to spend a carnival at Rome, especially when you have no great desire to sleep on the Piazza del Popolo or the Campo Vassino, they wrote to Signor Pastrini, the proprietor of the Hotel de Landros, Piazza di Spagna, to reserve comfortable apartments for them. Signor Pastrini replied that he had only two rooms and a parlor on the third floor, which he offered at low charge of a Louis per diem. They accepted this offer, but wishing to make the best use of the time that was left, Albert started for Naples. As for France, he remained at Florence, and after having passed a few days in exploring the paradise of the Cassine and spending two or three evenings at the houses of the Florentine nobility, he took a fancy into his head, having already visited Corsica, the cradle of Bonaparte, to visit Alba, the waiting place of Napoleon. One evening he cast off the painter of a sailboat from the iron ring that secured it to the dock of Lehorn, wrapped himself in his coat and lay down, and said to the crew, To the island of Elba. The boat shot out of the harbor like a bird, and next morning Franz disembarked at Porto Ferraggio. He traversed the island, after having followed the traces with footsteps that the giant had left, and re-embarked for Marciana. Two hours after, he again landed at Pianosa, where he was assured that red partridges abounded. The sport was bad. Franz only succeeded in killing a few bright riders, and, like every unsuccessful sportsman, he returned to the boat very much out of temper. Ah, if your excellence choose, said the captain, you might have capital sport. Where? Do you see that island? continued the captain, pointing to a conical pile rising from the indigo sea. Well, what is this island? The, the island of Monte Cristo. But I have no permission to shoot over this island. Your Excellency does not require a permit, for the island is uninhabited. Ah, indeed, said the young man. A desert island in the midst of the Mediterranean must be a curiosity. It is very natural. This island is a mass of rocks, and does not contain an acre of land capable of cultivation. To whom does this island belong? To Tuscany. What game shall I find there? Thousand of wild goats. Who live upon stones, I suppose, said Franz with an incredulous smile. No, but by browsing shrubs and trees that grow up to the crevices of the rocks. Where can I sleep? On shores in the grottoes, or on board in your cloak. Besides, if your excellency pleases, we can live as soon as you like. We can sail as well by night and by day, and if the wind drops, we can use our oars. As Franz had sufficient time, and his apartment at Rome were not yet available, he accepted the proposition. Upon his answer in the affirmative, the sailors exchanged a few words together in a lower tone. Well, asked he, what now? Is there any difficulty in the way? No, replied the captain, but we must warn your excellency that the island is an infected port. What do you mean? Monte Cristo, although uninhabited, yet serves occasionally as a refuge for the smugglers and pirates who come from Corsica, Sardinia and Africa, and if it becomes known that we have been there, we shall have to perform quarantine for six days on our return to Leghorn. The deuce! That puts a different face on the matter. Six days! Why, that's as long as the Almighty took to make the world. Too long a wait, too long. But who will say your excellency has been on Monte Cristo? Oh, I shall not, cried Franz. Nor I, nor I, chose the sailors. Then steer for Monte Cristo. The captain gave his orders, the helm was put up, and the boat was soon sailing in the direction of the island. 
friends waited until all was in order, and, when the sail was filled, and four sailors had taken their place, three forward and one at the helm, he resumed the conversation. Gaetano, said he to the captain, you tell me Monte Cristo serves as a refuge for pirates, who are, it seems to me, a very different kind of game from the goats. Yes, Your Excellency, and it is true. I know there were smugglers, but I thought that since the capture of Algiers and the destruction of the Regency, pirates existed only in the romances of Cooper and Captain Marriott. Your Excellency is mistaken. There are pirates, like the bandits who were believed to have been exterminated by Pope Leo XII, and who yet, every day, rob travelers at the gates of Rome. Has not Your Excellency heard that the French charge the fairs was robbed six months ago within five hundred paces of the lettery? Oh, yes, I heard that. Well, then, if, like us, Your Excellency lived the Leghorn, you would hear, from time to time, that a little merchant vessel, or an English yacht that was expected of Bastia at Porto Ferraccio or at Civita Vecchia, has not arrived. No one knows what has become of it, but, doubtless, it has struck on a rock and foundered. Now, this rock it has made has been a long and narrow boat, manned by six or eight men, who have surprised and plundered it, some dark and stormy night, near some desert and gloomy island, as bandits plunder a carriage in the recesses of a forest. But, asked Franz, who lay wrapped in his cloak at the bottom of the boat, why do not those who have been plundered complain to the French, Sardinian, or Tuscan governments? Why? said Gaetano with a smile. Yes, why? Because, in the first place, they transfer from the vessel to their own boat whatever they think was taken. Then, they bind the crew hand and foot, they attach to every one's neck a four and twenty pound ball, a large hole is chopped in the vessel's bottom, and then they leave her. At the end of ten minutes, the vessel begins to roll heavily and settle down. First one gun go under, then the other. Then they lift and sink again, and both go under at once. All at once there is a noise like a cannon. That's the air blowing up the deck. Soon the water rushes out of the scupper holes like a whale spouting. The vessel gives a last groan, spins round and round, and disappears, forming a vast whirlpool in the ocean. And then all is over, so that in five minutes nothing but the eye of God can see the vessel where she lies at the bottom of the sea. Do you understand now? said the captain. Why no complaints are made to the government, and why the vessel never reaches port? It is probable that if Gaetano had related this previous to proposing the expedition, France would have hesitated. but now that they had started, he thought it would be cowardly to draw back. He was one of those men who do not rashly court danger, but if danger presents itself, combat it with the most unutterable coolness. Calm and resolute, he treated any peril as he would an adversary in a duel, calculated its probable method of, of approach, retreated at all as a point of strategy and not from cowardice, was quick to see an opening for attack, and won victory at a single thrust. But, said he, I have travelled through Sicily and Calabria, I have sailed a month in the archipelago, and yet I never saw even the shadow of a bandit or a pirate. I did not tell you, Your Excellency, this to deter you from your project, replied Gaetano. But you questioned me, and I have answered. That's all. Yes, and your conversation is most interesting. And as I wish to enjoy it as long as possible, steer from Monte Cristo. The wind blew strongly. The boat made six or seven knots an hour, and they were rapidly reaching the end of their voyage. As they drew near, the island seemed to lift from the sea, and the air was so clear that they could already distinguish the rocks heaped on one another, like cannonballs in an arsenal, with green bushes and trees growing in the crevices. As for the sailors, although they appeared perfectly tranquil, yet it was evident that they were on the alert, and that they carefully watched the glassy surface over which they were sailing, and on which a few fishing boats, with their white sails, were alone visible. They were within fifteen miles of Monte Cristo when the sun began to set behind Corsica, 
whose mountains appeared against the sky, showing their rough peaks in bold relief. This mass of rock, like the giant of the master, rose dead ahead, a formidable barrier, and intercepting the light that gilded at its massive peaks so that the voyagers were in shadow. Little by little, the shadow rose higher and seemed to drive before it the last ray of the expiring day. At last, the reflection rested on the summit of the mountain, where it paused an instant, like the fiery crest of a volcano, and then gloom gradually covered the summit, as it had covered the base, and the island now only appeared to be a grey mountain that grew continually darker. Half an hour after, the night was quite dark. Fortunately, the mariners were used to these latitudes, and knew every rock in the Tuscan archipelago, for in the midst of this obscurity France was not without uneasiness. Corsica had long since disappeared, and Monte Cristo itself was invisible. But sailors seemed, like the lynx, to see in the dark, and the power to steer did not evince the slightest hesitation. An hour passed since the sun had set, when Franz fancied he saw, at a quarter of a mile to the left, a dark mass, but he could not precisely make out what it was, and fearing to excite the mere sun sailors by mistaking a floating cloud for land, he remained silent. Suddenly a great light appeared on the strand. Land might resemble a cloud, but fire was not a meteor. "'What is this light?' asked he. "'Hush,' said the captain, "'it is a fire.' But you told me the island was uninhabited. I said there were no fixed habitations on it, but I said also that it served sometimes as a harbor for smugglers. And for pirates? And for pirates, returned Gaetano, repeating Francis' words. It is for that reason I have given orders to pass the island, for, as you see, the fire is behind us. But this fire? continued Franz. It seems to me rather reassuring than otherwise. Men who did not wish to be seen would not light a fire. Oh, that goes for nothing, said Gaetano. If you can guess the position of the island in the darkness, you will see that the fire cannot be seen from the side or from Pianosa, but only from the sea. You think, then, this fire indicates the presence of unpleasant neighbors? That is what we must find out returned Gaetano, fixing his eyes on the terrestrial star. How can you find out? You shall see. Gaetano consulted with his companions, and after five minutes' discussion, a maneuver was executed which caused the vessel to tack out. They returned the way they had come, and in a few minutes the fire disappeared, hidden by an elevation of the land. The pilot again changed the course of the boat, which rapidly approached the island, and was soon within fifteen paces of it. Gaetano lowered the sail, and the boat came to rest. All this was done in silence, and from the moment that their course was changed, not a word was spoken. Gaetano, who had proposed the expedition, had taken all the responsibility on himself. The four sailors fixed their eyes on him, while they go out their oars, and held themselves in readiness to row away, which, thanks to the darkness, not be difficult. As for Franz, he examined his arms with the utmost coolness. He had two double barrel guns and a rifle. He loaded them, looked at the priming, and waited quietly. During this time, the captain had thrown off his vest and shirt, and secured his trousers round his waist. His feet were naked, so he had no shoes and stockings to take off. After these preparations, he placed his finger on his lips and lowering himself noiselessly into the sea, swam towards the shore with such precaution that it was impossible to hear the slightest sound. He could only be traced by the phosphorescent line in his way. This track soon disappeared. It was evident that he had touched the shore. Everyone on board remained motionless for half an hour, when the same luminous track was again observed, and the swimmer was soon on board. Well, exclaimed Franz and sailors in unison. They are Spanish smugglers, said he. They have with them two Corsican bandits. And what are these Corsican bandits doing here with Spanish smugglers? 
Ailas, returned the captain with an accent of the most profound pity. We are always to help one another. Very often the bandits are hard pressed by gendarmes or carabineers. Well, they see a vessel, and good fellows like us on board, they come and demand hospitality of us. You can't refuse help to a poor hunted devil. We receive them, and for a greater security we stand out to sea. This costs us nothing and saves the life, or at least liberty, of a fellow creature who on first occasion returns service by pointing out some safe spot where we can land our goods without interruption. Ah, said Franz, then you are a smuggler occasionally, Gaetano. Your Excellency, we must live somehow, returned the other, smiling impenetrably. Then you know the men who are now on Monte Cristo. Oh, yes, we sailors are like Freemasons and recognize each other by signs. And do you think we have nothing to fear if we land? Nothing at all. Smugglers are not thieves. But these two Corsican bandits, said Franz, calculating the chances of peril. It is not their fault that they are bandits, but that of the authorities. How so? Because they are pursued for having made the stiff, as if it was not in a Corsican's nature to revenge himself. What do you mean by having made the stiff? Having assassinated a man? said Franz, continuing his investigation. I mean that they have killed an enemy, which is a very different thing, returned the captain. Well, said the young man, let us demand hospitality of these smugglers and bandits. Do you think they will grant it? Without doubt. How many are they? Four, and the two bandits make six. Just our number, so if they prove troublesome, we shall be able to hold them in check. So, for the last time, steer to Monte Cristo. Yes, but your Excellency will permit us to take all due precautions. By all means, be as wise as Nestor and as prudent as Ulysses. I will more than permit, I exhort you. Silence, then, said Gaetano. Everyone obeyed. For a man who, like friends, viewed his position in its true light, it was a grave one. He was alone in the darkness with sailors whom he did not know, and who had no reason to be devoted to him, who knew that he had several thousand francs in his belt, and who had often examined these weapons, which were very beautiful, if not with envy, at least with curiosity. On the other hand, he was about to land, without any other escort than these men, on an island which had, indeed, a very religious name but which did not seem to France likely to afford him much hospitality, thanks to the smugglers and bandits. The history of the scuttled vessels, which had appeared improbable during the day, seemed very probable at night. Placed as he was between two possible sources of danger, he kept his eyes on the crew and his gun in his hand. The sailors had again hoisted sail, and the vessel was once more cleaving the waves. Through the darkness, France whose eyes were now more accustomed to it, could see the looming shore along which the boat was sailing, and then, as they rounded the rocky point, he saw the fire more brilliant than ever, and about it five or six persons seated. The blades illuminated the sea for a hundred paces around. Gaetano skirted light, carefully keeping the boat in shadow. Then, when they were opposite the fire, he steered to the center of the circle, singing a fishing song, of which his companions sang the chorus. At first words, the song the men seated round the fire arose and approached the landing place, their eyes fixed on the boat, evidently seeking to know who the newcomers were and what were their intentions. They soon appeared satisfied and returned, with the exception of one who remained at shore, to their fire, on which the carcass of a goat was roasting. When the boat was within twenty paces of the shore, the men on the beach, who carried the carbine, presented arms after the manner of a sentinel and cried, Who comes there? in Sardinian. Friends coolly cocked both perils. Gaetano then exchanged a few words with this man, which the traveller did not understand, but which evidently concerned him. Will your excellency give your name or remain incognito? asked the captain. My name must remain unknown, 
merely say I'm a Frenchman traveling for pleasure. As soon as Gaetano had transmitted this answer, the sentinel gave an order to one of the men seated round the fire, who rose and disappeared among the rocks. Not a word was spoken, everyone seemed occupied. France with his disembarkment, the sailors with their sails, the smugglers with their gold. But in the midst of all this careness, it was evident that they mutually observed each other. The man who had disappeared returned suddenly on the opposite side to that by which he had left. He made a sign with his head to the sentinel, who, turning to the boat, said, Sacomodi. The Italian Sacomodi is untranslatable. It means at once, come, enter, you are welcome, make yourself at home, you are the master. It is like that Turkish phrase of Molière that so astonished you for wise gentlemen, but a number of things implied in its utterance. And the sailors did not wait for a second invitation, for stroke of the war brought them to land. Gaetano sprang to shore, exchanged a few words with the sentinel, then his comrades disembarked, and last he came friends. One of his guns was slung over his shoulder, Gaetano had the other, and the sailor held his rifle. His dress, half artist, half dandy, did not excite any suspicion and, consequently, no attitude. The boat was moored to shore, and they advanced a few paces to find a comfortable bivouac. But doubtless, the spot they chose did not suit smugglers who filled the post of sentinel, for he cried out, Not that way, if you please. Gaetano faltered an excuse, and advanced to the opposite side, while two sailors kindled the torches at fire to light them on their way. They advanced about thirty paces, and then stopped at a small explanade surrounded with rocks, in which seats had been cut, not unlike same three boxes. Around in the crevices of the rocks grew a few dwarf oaks and thick bushes of myrtles. Franz lowered the torch and saw by the mass of cinders that had accumulated that he was not first to discover this retreat, which was, doubtless, one of the halting places of the wandering visitors of Monte Cristo. As for his suspicions, once on terra firma, once that he had seen the indifferent, if not friendly, appearance of his host, his anxiety had quite disappeared, or rather, at sight of the gold, had turned to appetite. He mentioned this to Gaetano, who replied that nothing could be more easy than to prepare a supper when had in their boat bread, wine, half a dozen partridges, and a good fire to roast them by. Besides, added he, if the smell of their roast meat tempts you, I will go and offer them two of our boars for a slice. You are a born diplomat, returned Franz. Go and try. Meanwhile, the sailors had collected dried sticks and branches with which they made the fire. Franz waited impatiently, inhaling the aroma of the roasted meat, when the captain returned with a mysterious air. Well, said Franz, anything new? Do they refuse? On the contrary, returned Gaetano, the chief who was told you are a young Frenchman, invites you to sup with him. Well, observed France, this chief is very polite, and I see no objection. The more so as I bring my share of the supper. Oh, it is not that. He has plenty and to spare for supper, but he makes one condition, and rather a peculiar one, before he will receive you at his house. His house? Has he built one here, then? No, but he has a very comfortable and all the same, so they say. You know this chief, then? I have heard talk of him. Favorably or otherwise? Both. The dears, and what is this condition? That you are blindfolded and do not check off the benches until he himself bids you. Franz looked at Caetano to see, if possible, what he thought of his proposal. Ah, replied he, guessing Franz's thought, I know this is a serious matter. What should you do in my place? I, who have nothing to lose, I should go. You would accept? Yes, were it only out of curiosity. There is something very peculiar about this chief, then. Listen. 
said Gaetano, lowering his voice. I do not know if what they say is true. He stopped to see if anyone was near. What do they say? That this chief inhabits a cavern to which the pity palace is nothing. What nonsense! said Fraz, reseating himself. It is not nonsense, it is quite true. Kama, the pilot of St. Ferdinand, went in once, and he came back amazed, vowing that such treasures were only to be heard of in fairy tales. Do you know, observed Fraz, that with such stories you will make me think of Ali Baba's enchanted cavern? I tell you what I have been told. Then you advise me to accept. Oh, I don't say that. Your Excellency will do as you please. I should be sorry to advise you in the matter. Franz pondered the matter for a few moments, concluded that the man so rich could not have any intention of plundering him of what little he had, and seeing only the prospect of a good supper, accepted. Gaetano departed with the reply. Franz was prudent, and wished to learn all the possibly could concerning his host. He turned towards the sailor, who, during this dialogue, had sat gravely plucking the petri dish with the air of a man proud of his office, and asked him how this man had landed, as no vessel of any kind was visible. Never mind that, returned the sailor. I know their vessel. Is it a very beautiful vessel? I would not wish for a very to sail round the world. Of what burden is she? About a hundred tons, but she is built to stand any weather. She is what English call a yacht. Where was she built? I know not, but my own opinion is she is a Genoese. And how did the leader of smugglers, continued France, venture to build a vessel designed for such a purpose at Genoa? I did not say that the owner was a smuggler, replied the sailor. No, but Gaetano did, I thought. Gaetano had only seen the vessel from a distance. He had not then spoken to anyone. And if this person be not a smuggler, who is he? A wealthy signor, who travels for his pleasure. Come, thought Fred. He is still more mysterious, since the two accounts do not agree. What is his name? If you ask him, he says Simbad Sailor but I doubt if it be his real name. Sinbad Sailor? Yes. And where does he reside? On sea. What country does he come from? I do not know. Have you ever seen him? Sometimes. What sort of man is he? Your Excellency will judge for yourself. Where will he receive me? No doubt in the subterranean place Guy Channel told you of. Have you ever had a curiosity, when we have landed and found this island deserted, to seek for this enchanted palace? Oh yes, more than once, but always in vain. We examined the grotto all over, but we never could find the slightest trace of any opening. They say that the door is not opened by a key, but a magic word. Decidedly, muttered Fred, this is an Arabian night's adventure. His Excellency waits for you, said a voice, which he recognized as that of the sentinel. He was accompanied by two of the edge's crew. Franz drew his handkerchief from his pocket and presented it to the man who had spoken to him. Without uttering a word, they bandaged his eyes with a care that showed their apprehension of his committing some indiscretion. Afterwards, he was made to promise that he would not make the least attempt to raise the bandage. He promised. Then his two guides took his arms, and he went on, guided by them, and preceded by the sentinel. After going about thirty paces, he smelled the appetizing odor of the key that was roasting, and knew thus he was passing the bivouac. They then led him on about fifty paces further, evidently advancing towards that part of the shore where they would not allow that channel to go, a refusal he could now comprehend. Presently, by a change in the atmosphere, he knew that they were entering a cave. After going on for a few seconds more, he heard a crackling, and it seemed to him as though the atmosphere again changed, and became balmy and perfumed. 
At length his feet touched on a thick and soft carpet, and his guides let go their hold of him. There was a moment's silence, and then a voice, in excellent French, although with a foreign accent, said, Welcome, sir. I beg you will remove your bandage. It may be supposed, then, Franz did not wait for a repetition of this permission, but took off the handkerchief, and found himself in the presence of a man from thirty-eight to forty years of age, dressed in a Tunisian costume, that is to say, a red cap with a long blue silk tassel, a vest of black cloth embroidered with gold, pantalons of deep red, large and full gaiters of the same color, embroidered with gold like vest and yellow slippers. He had a splendid cashmere round his waist, and a small, sharp, and crooked kangir was passed through his girdle. Although of a paleness that was almost livid, this man had a remarkably handsome face. His eyes were penetrating and sparkling. His nose, quite straight and projecting direct from the brow, was of the pure Greek type, while his teeth, as white as pearls, were set off admiration by the black moustache that encircled them. His failure was so peculiar that it seemed to pertain to one who had been long in tombs and who was incapable of resuming the healthy glow and hue of life. He was not particularly tall, but extremely well made, and, like the man of the south, had small hands and feet. But what astonished friends, who had treated Gaetano's description as a fable, was the splendor of the apartment in which he found himself. The entire chamber was lined with crimson brocade, worked with flowers of gold. In the recess was a kind of divan, surmounted with a stand of Arabian swords in silver scabbards, and handles resplendent with gems. From the ceiling hung a lamp of Venetian glass, a beautiful shape and color, while the feet rested on a turkey carpet in which they sunk to the instep. Tapestry hung before the door by which friends have entered, and also in front of another door leading into a second apartment which seemed to be brilliantly illuminated. The host gave friends time to recover from his surprise, and, moreover, returned look for look, not even taking his eyes off him. Sir, he said, after a pause. A thousand excuses for the precaution taken in your introduction hither, but as, during the great portion of the year, this island is deserted, if the secret of this abode were discovered, I should not less find on my return my temporary retirement in a state of great disorder, which would be exceedingly annoying, not for the loss it occasioned me, but because I should not have the certainty I now possess of separating myself from all the rest of mankind at pleasure. Let me now endeavor to make you forget this temporary unpleasantness and offer you what, no doubt, you did not expect to find here, that is to say, a tolerable supper and pretty comfortable beds. Ma foi, my dear sir, replied Franz, make no apologies. I have always observed that they bandage people's eyes who penetrate enchanted palaces, for instance, those of Raoul in the Ugnots, and really I have nothing to complain of, for what I see makes me think of the wonders of the Arabian Nights. Alas, I may say with Lucullus, if I could have anticipated the honor of your visit, I would have prepared for it. But such as my hermitage, it is at your disposal. Such as is my supper, it is yours to share, if you will. Ali, it's supper ready. At this moment, the tapestry moved aside, and a Nubian, black as ebony, and dressed in a plain white tunic, made a sign to his master that all was prepared in the dining room. Now, said the unknown to friends, I do not know if you are of my opinion, but I think nothing is more annoying than to remain two or three hours together without knowing by name or appellation how to address one another. Pray observe that I too must respect the laws of hospitality to ask your name or title. I only request you to give me one by which I may have the pleasure of addressing you. As for myself, that I may put at your ease, I tell you that I am generally called Simbad Sailor. And I, replied Franz, will tell you, as I only require is 
wonderful lamb to make me precisely like Aladdin, that I see no reason why at this moment I should not be called Aladdin. That will keep us from going away from the east, whither I am tempted to think I have been conveyed by some good genius. Well then, Signor Aladdin, replied the singular amphitryon, you heard our repast announced. Will you not take the trouble to enter the dining room, your humble servant going first to show you the way? At these words, moving aside the tapestry, Simbad preceded his guest. Friends now looked upon another scene of enchantment. The tables were splendid covered, and once, convinced of this important point, he cast his eyes around him. The dining room was scarcely less striking than the room he had just left. It was entirely of marble, with antique bas reliefs of priceless value. And at four corners of this apartment, which was of long, were four magnificent statues, having baskets in their hands. These baskets contained four pyramids of most splendid fruit. There were Sicily pineapples, pomegranates from Malaga, origins from the Balearic Islands, peaches from France, and dates from Tunis. The supper consisted of a roast pheasant garnish with Corsican blackbirds, a boiled ham with jelly, a quarter of a kid with tartar sauce, a glorious turbot and a gigantic lobster. Between these large dishes were smaller ones containing various dainties. The dishes were of silver and the plates of Japanese china. Friends rubbed his eyes in order to assure himself that this was not a dream. Ali alone was present to wait at table, and acquitted himself so admirably that the guest complimented his host thereupon. Yes, replied he, while he did the honors of the supper with much ease and grace. Yes, he is a poor devil who is much devoted to me, and does all he can to prove it. He remembers that I saved his life and as he has regard for his head, he feels some gratitude towards me for having kept it on his shoulders. Ellie approached his master, took his hand, and kissed it. Would it be impertinent, Signor Simbad, said Franz, to ask you the particulars of this kindness? Oh, they are simple enough, replied the host. It seems the fellow had been caught wandering nearer to the harem of the Bay of Tunis, then it he kept promised to one of his scholars, and he was condemned by the bay to have his tongue cut out and his hands and a head cut off, the tongue the first day, the hands second, and the head the third. I always had a desire to have a mute in my service, so learning the day his tongue was cut out, I went to the bay and proposed to give him for Ali a splendid double-barreled gun, which I knew he was very desirous of having. He hesitated a moment. He was so very desirous to complete the poor devil's punishment. But when I added to the gun an English cutlass, with which I had shivered with Highness Yatagan to pieces, the bay yielded, and agreed to forgive the hand that had, but on condition that the poor fellow never again set foot on Tunis. This was a useless clause in the bargain, for whenever the coward sees the first glimpse of the shores of Africa, he runs down below, and can only be induced to appear again when we are out of sight of that quarter of the globe. Friends remained a moment silent and pensive, hardly knowing what to think of the half-kindless, half-cruelty with which his host related the brief narrative. And like the celebrated sailor whose name you have assumed, he said, by way of changing the conversation, you pass your life in travelling? Yes. I made the vow at the time, when I little thought I should be able to accomplish it, said I known with a singular smile, and I made some others also which I hope I may fulfill in due season. Although Simbad pronounced these words with much calmness, his eyes gave forth gleams of extraordinary ferocity. You have suffered a great deal, sir, said Franz inquiringly. Simbad started and looked fixed at him as he replied, What makes you suppose so? Everything, answered Franz. Your voice, your look, your pallid complexion, and even the life you live. I? I live the happiest life possible, the real life of a pasha. 
I'm king of all creation. I am pleased with one place and stay there. I get tired of it, I leave it. I am free as a bird and have wings like one. My attendants obey my slightest wish. Sometimes I amuse myself by delivering some bandit or criminal from the bonds of the law. Then I have my mode of dispensing justice, silent and sure, without respite or appeal, which condemns or pardons, and which no one sees. Ha! Huh. If you had tasted my life, you would not desire any other, and would never return to the world unless you had some great project to accomplish there. Revenge, for instance? Absurd friends. The unknown fixed on the young man one of those looks which penetrate into the depths of heart and thoughts. And why revenge? he asked. Because, replied Franz, you seem to me like a man who, persecuted by society, has a fearful account to settle with it. Ha! Ah, responded Simbad, laughing with his singular laugh which displayed his white and sharp teeth. You have not guessed rightly. Such as you see me, I am a sort of philosopher, and one day, perhaps, I shall go to Paris to rival Monsieur Appert and little man in the blue cloak. And will that be the first time you ever took that journey? Yes, it will. I must seem to you by no means curious, but I assure you that it is not my fault I have delayed it so long. It will happen one day or the other. And do you propose to make this journey very shortly? I do not know. It depends on circumstances which depend on certain arrangements. I shall like to be there at the time you come, and I will endeavor to repay you, as far as lies in my power, for your liberal hospitality displayed to me in Monte Cristo. I should avail myself of your offer with pleasure, replied the host, but unfortunately, if I go there, it will be, in all probability, incognito. The supper appeared to have been supplied solely for friends, for the unknown scarcely touched one or two dishes of the splendid banquet, to which his guest did ample justice. Then Ellie brought on dessert, or rather took the baskets from the hands of the statues and placed them on the table. Between the two baskets he placed a small silver cup with a silver cover. The care with which Tali placed his cup on the table roused friends' curiosity. He raised the cover and saw a kind of greenish past, something like preserved angelica, but which was perfectly unknown to him. He replaced the lid, as ignorant of what the cup contained as if he was before he had looked at it, and then casting his eyes towards his host, he saw him smile at his disappointment. You cannot guess, said he, what there is in that small vase, can you? No, I really cannot. Well then, that green preserve is nothing less than the ambrosia which Eve served at the table of Jupiter. But, replied Franz, this ambrosia, no doubt, is passing through mortal hands, has lost its heavenly appellation and assumed the human name. In vulgar phrase, what may you term this composition for which, to tell the truth, I do not feel any particular desire? Ah! Thus it is that our material origin is revealed, cried Simbad. We frequently pass so near to happiness without seeing, without regarding it, or if we do see and regard it, yet without recognizing it. Are you a man of substantials, and is called your god? Taste this, and the minds of Peru, Guzerat, and Golconda are open to you. Are you a man of imagination, a poet? Taste this and the boundaries of possibility disappear, the fields of infinite place open to you, you advance free in heart, free in mind, into the boundless realms of unfettered reverie. Are you ambitious, and do you seek after the greatness of the earth? Taste this, and in an hour you will be a king, not the king of a petty kingdom hidden in some corner of Europe like France, Spain or England, but king of the world, king of the universe, king of creation. Without bowing at the feet of Satan, we will be king and master of all the kingdom of the earth. Is it not tempting that I offer you, and is it not an easy thing, since it is only to do that? Look! At this word, 
he uncovered a small cup which contained substance so loud that took a teaspoon of the magic sweet, sweet meat, raised it to his lips, and swallowed it slowly, with his eyes half shut and his head bent backwards. Franz did not disturb him whilst he observed his favorite sweet meat, but when he had finished he inquired, What then is this precious stuff? Did you ever hear, he replied, of the old man of the mountain who attempted to assassinate Philip Angostus? Of course I have. Well, you know he reigned over a rich valley, which was overhung by the mountain whence he derived his picturesque name. In this valley were magnificent gardens planted by Hathin ben Sabbath, and in these gardens isolated pavilions. Into these pavilions he admitted select, and there, says Marco Polo, gave them to eat a certain herb, which transported them to paradise, in the midst of ever-blooming shrubs, ever-ripe fruit, and ever-lovely virgins. What these happy persons took for reality was but a dream. But it was a dream so soft, so voluptuous, so enthralling, that they sold themselves body and soul to him to give it to them. And obedient to his orders as to those of the deity, struck down the designated victim, died in torture without a murmur, believing that the death they underwent was but a quick transition to that life of delights of which the only herb, now before you, had given them a slight foretaste. Then, cried Franz, it is a shish. I know that, by name at least. That is it precisely, Signor Aladdin. It is a shish, the purest and most unadulterated ashes of Alexandria. The ashes of Abu Ghor, the celebrated maker, the only man, the man to whom there should be built a palace, inscribed with these words, a grateful world to the dealer in happiness. Do you know, said Franz, I have a very great inclination to trust for myself of the truth or exaggeration of your eulogies. Just for yourself, Signor Eleven, judge, but do not confine yourself to one trial. Like everyone else, we must habituate the senses to a fresh impression, gentle or violent, sad or joyous. There is a struggle in nature against this divine substance. In nature which is not made for joy and clings to pain. Nature subdued most yelled in the combat. The dream must succeed to reality, and then the dream reigns supreme. Then the dream becomes life, for life becomes a dream. But what changes occur? It is only by comparing the pains of actual being with the joys of the assumed existence that you would desire to live no longer, but to dream thus forever. When you return to this mundane sphere from your visionary world, you would seem to live in a Napoleon spring for a Lapland winter, to quit paradise for earth, heaven for hell. Taste ashes, guest of mine, taste the hashish. Friends' only reply was to take a teaspoonful of the marvelous preparation, about as much in quantity as his host had eaten, and lift it to his mouth. Diable, he said after having swallowed the divine preserve. I do not know if the results will be as agreeable as you describe, but things not appear to me as palatable as you say. Because your palate has not yet been attuned to the sublimity of the substances it flavors. Tell me, the first time you tasted oyster, tea, porter, truffles, and sundry other dainties which you now adore, did you like them? Could you comprehend how the Romans stuffed their pheasants with asafoetida, and the Chinese eat swallows' nests? Hey, no. Well, it is the same with hashish. Only eat for a week, and nothing in the world will seem to you to equal the delicacy of its flavor, which now appears to you flat and distasteful. Let us now go into the adjoining chamber, which is your apartment, and I will bring us coffee and pipes. The bulls arose, and while he, who called himself Simbad, and who made occasionally named so, that he might, like his guest, have some title by which to distinguish them, give some orders to the servant, Fred entered still another apartment. It was simply yet richly furnished. It was round, and a large divan completely encircled it. 
divan, walls, ceiling, floor, were all covered with magnificent skins as soft and downy as the richest carpets. There were heavy maned lion skins from Atlas, striped tiger skins from Bengal, panther skins from the Cape, sported beautifully, like those that appeared to Dante, bear skins from Siberia, fox skins from Norway, and so on. And all these skins were strewn in profusion one on the other, so that it seemed like walking over the most mossy turf or reclining on the most luxurious bed. Both laid themselves down on the divan. Chibooks with jasmine tubes and hambar mouthpieces were with, within reach, and all prepared so there was no need to smoke the same pipe twice. Each of them took one, which Ali lighted and then retired to prepare the coffee. There was a moment's silence, during which Timbad gave himself up to thoughts that seemed to occupy him incessantly, even in the midst of his conversation and Franz abandoned himself to that mute reverie into which he always sink when smoking excellent tobacco, which seems to remove with its fume all the troubles of the mind and to give the smoker in exchange all the vision of the soul. Ali brought in the coffee. How do you take it? inquired the unknown. In the French or Turkish style, strong or weak, sugar or none, cool or boiling, as you please, it is ready in all ways. I will take it in the Turkish style, replied Franz. And you are right, said his host. It shows you have a tendency for an oriental life. Ah, those orientals. They are the only men who know how to live. As for me, he added, with one of those singular smiles which did not escape the young man. When I have completed my affairs in Paris, I shall go and die in the East. And should you wish to see me again, you must seek me at Cairo, Baghdad, or Isfahan. Ma foi, said Franz, it would be the easiest thing in the world, for I feel eagle's wings springing out of my shoulders, and with those wings I could make a tour of the world in four and twenty hours. Ah, yes, the Ashis is beginning its work. Well, unfurl your wings and fly into superhuman regions. Fear nothing, there is a watch over you, and if your wings, like those of Icarus, melt before the sun, we are here to ease your fall. He then sent something in Arabic to Ali, who made a sign of obedience and withdrawal, but not to any distance. As to friends, a strange transformation had taken place in him. All the bodily fatigue of the day, all the preoccupation of mind, which the events of the evening had brought on, disappeared as they do with the first approach of sleep, when we are still sufficiently conscious to be aware of the coming of slumber. His body seemed to acquire an airy lightness, his perception brightened in a remarkable manner, his senses seemed to redouble their power, the horizon continued to expand. But it was not the gloomy horizon of vague dreams, of vague alarms, and which he had seen before he slept, but a blue, transparent, unbounded horizon, with all the blue of the ocean, all the spangles of the sun, all the perfumes of the summer breeze. Then, in the midst of the songs of his sailors, songs so clear and sonorous, that they would have made a divine harmony had their notes been taken down. He saw the island of Monte Cristo, no longer as a threatening rock in the midst of the waves, but as an oasis in the desert. Then, as his boat drew nearer, the songs became louder, for an enchanting and mysterious harmony rose to heaven, as if some Lorelei had attracted to attract a soul theater, or Amphion, the enchanter, intended there to build a city. At length the boat touched the shore, but without effort, without shock, as lips touched lips, and he entered the grotto amidst continued strains of most delicious melody. He descended, or rather seemed to descend, several steps, inhaling the fresh and balmy air, like that which may be supposed to reign around the grotto of Circe, formed from such perfumes as set the mind a dreaming, and such fires as burned the very senses. And he saw again all he had seen before his sleep, from Sinbad, his singular host, to Ali, the mute attendant. 
Then all seemed to fade away and become confused before his eyes, like the last shadows of magic lantern before it is extinguished, and he was again in the chamber of statues, lighted only by one of those pale and antique lamps which watch in the dead of the night over the sleep of pleasure. They were the same statues, rich in form, in attraction and poesy, with eyes of fascination, smiles of love, and bright and flowing hair. They were Phryne, Cleopatra, Messalina, those three celebrated courtesans. Then among them glided like a pure ray, like a Christian angel in the midst of Olympus, one of those chest figures, those calm shadows, those soft visions, which seemed to veil its virgin brow before these marble wantons. Then the three statues advanced towards him with looks of love, and approached the couch on which he was reposing, their feet hidden in their long white tunics, their throats bare, hair flowing like waves, and assuming attitudes which the gods could not resist, but which stains with truth, and looks inflexible and ardent like those with which the serpent charms the bird. And then he gave way before looks that held him in a torturous grasp and lighted his senses as with a voluptuous kiss. It seemed to friends that he closed his eyes, and in a last look about him saw that the vision of modesty completely veiled, and then followed the dream of passion like that promised by the prophet to the elect. Lips of stone turned to flame, breasts of ice became like heated lava, so that to friends Yielding for the first time to the sway of the drug, love was a sorrow and voluptuous torture, as a burning mouth were pressed to his thirsty lips, and he was held in cool serpent-like embraces. The more he strove against this unallowed passion, the more his senses yielded to his thrall, and at length, weary of a struggle that taxed his very soul, he gave way and sank back restless and exhausted beneath the kisses of these marble goddesses and the enchantment of his marvelous dream. End of chapter 31